Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being here today, and thank you very much for having me. I would like to begin with shortly telling you my sepsis story. So here in 2012, I am a very happy and healthy 28-year-old. On what seemed to be a very, very ordinary Wednesday, I went to work, and afterwards I went to the gym and I attended a group training class. I was strong, and I felt very normal. But on my way to the locker room, I had this peculiar stomachache, as if a giant worm was squirming around inside my stomach. A few hours later, I called the emergency number for the first time because I had chest pains. The ambulance came, they saw that I had rapid breathing and a heart rate of 144, but no other symptoms. Even though I practically begged them to take me to the hospital with them, they told me that I was having a panic attack. And they said that I should call someone so I wouldn't be alone. So of course, I called my little brother. Three hours later, my brother found me unconscious in the kitchen. My face had turned blue, and I didn't respond to his questions. So of course, he called the emergency number once again. Now, I still had an elevated heart rate. I had very high fever, low saturation, and spots on my skin. Meningococcal septicemia was my diagnose. And the doctors told my brother to call our parents and our family and friends and everyone who wants to be by my side because I wouldn't make it through the night. Well, I did survive, but on the expense of both of my lower legs. The doctors had no other viable options than to amputate them both below the knees. So there I was at what was supposed to be the absolute prime of my life with no hope and no belief in the future. In an, sort of an attempt to regain control of my life, I returned to the gym, and there I met the person who changed everything, my trainer, Kaisa. She suggested that I should participate in Sweden's largest triathlon competition. What you need to know, and it's very relevant, that I didn't know how to swim. I have always been terrified of water. I hated running, and I, you know, I only biked as a child, because that is what you do in a triathlon, right? You swim, you bike, and you run. It was a big challenge to take on, but I had already lost everything. So three years after my sepsis, I was on the starting line of Stockholm Triathlon. I was nervous, and I was afraid, and I felt so out of place, but it was go time. And I did it. I swam 1,500 meters, I biked 40 kilometers, and I ran 10 kilometers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I crossed the finish line as the first ever double amputee in Sweden to do so. The following year, I went for the greatest adventure of them all. I managed to qualify for the Paralympic Games in Rio. And this time, I crossed the finish line as the seventh best paratriathlete in the world. <laughs> Thank you. So when I began to speak about my journey to audiences consisting mainly of the public, but also healthcare professionals, it became very evident to me that very few knew what sepsis is and what the symptoms are. And to be clear, I had no idea either before I got sick. There was a severe void in knowledge. And I made it my main goal to make sure that no one, no one has to go through what I went through. I joined forces with the Swedish Trust, Sepsis Trust in Sweden, and we have been working relentlessly, I think that is the word for today, relentlessly to make sure to raise awareness, to fund research, to increase patient safety, and to make sure that the quality of life for sepsis survivor is high. And of course, I feel very privileged to be here today and alive to be the voice and represent the 50 million people 
who get sick from sepsis every year. So I believe that there are many incentives to why we should address sepsis as very important and one of the greatest challenges of our time. Let's just have a look at me, shall we? I was in a medically induced coma for 13 days. I was in the ICU for eight weeks. I was admitted in the hospital for over seven months. I have been operated on 53 times. And as long as I am alive, the Swedish healthcare system is obliged to provide me with prosthetic legs. Undoubtedly, I have cost a lot of money. I believe that the economic burden speaks for itself. The grief and the sadness I feel for having lost of my, both of my legs is a heavy and constant cross to bear. My family and my friends, they have endured so much pain, so much worry. I was the one who got sick, but I believe that sex sepsis took so much from all of us. But here comes the big paradox, right? All of this could have been prevented. And mind you, I live in Sweden. I understand how privileged I am. It's a high income country with one of the strongest healthcare systems in the world, but still to this day, in Sweden, we cannot secure adequate prevention, early identification, and <coughs> timely treatment of sepsis. That is mind-boggling, and not in a good way. I, I think, Eli, I know that we have the data, and we have the knowledge on what needs to be done. And I strongly believe that we have the obligation of saving the lives of the children, the women, and men who suffer and die from sepsis every year. Thank you very much. Thank you.